himself alive. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this um, district planning committee on Thursday, 21st of March 2024. Uh, I'm Councillor Phillips, Chairman of the committee. To my left is Councillor Sweatman, my Vice Chairman. To my right uh, is Steve King, the Planning Applications Team Leader. To his left is, uh, to his right, sorry, is Paul Weeks, um, our legal expert today. Uh, on the corner at the far end um, is Ian Gledhall from County Highways and uh, Natalie James, um, a drainage engineer from Mid Sussex Council. And in the corner behind me are members of Democratic Services who will be uh, taking the minutes and controlling the technology today. Um, first item on the agenda is to receive apologies for absence. Uh, we do have a full house today, so uh, welcome everybody. Uh, to re receive declarations of interest from members in respect of any matter on the agenda. Can they please push to mic it, to, uh, the mics if uh, they have any. Right, I see none. Uh, to consider any items that the chairman agrees to take as urgent business, I have none. So we move on to the substantive items on the agenda today. Uh, item four, uh, recommendation for approval, DM 230827, West Hoth Line Bricks Works, Hampsey Road, Sharpthorn, East Grinstead, West Sussex, RH19 4PB. Uh, and I'll ask Stuart Malcolm to make the presentation, please. Okay, thanks, Chairman. Um, I'll just draw members' attention to the update sheet, first of all, if I may. Uh, just a couple of updates to take you through. Um, we've received four additional letters of representation since the agenda was put together, just raising a couple of additional points that aren't already set out in the report, uh, paragraph 4.1, uh, and are set out before you. And then really the rest of the updates are just of some minor rewording really of some of the conditions that there is reference there to just removing the word off-site and that in paragraph 12.127. Um, and that was just a, a typo referring to off-site biodiversity net gain, but it is all on-site biodiversity net gain as we'll, we'll talk about in a moment. But yeah, the, the, the rest of the updates are really just about sort of rewording conditions, particularly around the trigger point so that uh, demolition is excluded from the definition of development uh, and just putting the agricultural method statement within to the construction management plan and finally just a, a, an amendment to the more substantive one about the sustainability statement condition 31 is just referring to uh, the EV, PV and air source heat pump plan as well as the applicant's energy and sustainability statement. Um, yeah, that's it in terms of updates. So moving on to the application itself. Um, so, you know, the application site is the former West Hoadley Brickworks site that is on the northern edge of the village of Sharpthorn, as shown here on the, the left-hand plan. Uh, this plan really shows a bit more context in, in the, the wider setting as you'll see the village of Sharpthorn immediately abutting to the south and further to the west, um, the, the, the neighbouring village of West Hoadley. So the site, as indicated by the red line plan on both of these images, uh, measures just over 16 hectares in area and is only accessed from the south at the northern end of Hamsey Road. This is Hamsey Road here, which itself links to Station Road which is located here, and that joins in to Top Road that runs through Sharpthorn and over towards West Hoadley. So the plan on the right, this shows that the buildings and other built form on the site at the moment, um, all those associated with the brick making process, these are largely concentrated in the, the northwest corner of the application site, and the rest of the site, as well as land outside the application site, to the east. This is all land that was used previously for mineral ex extraction activities. So mineral extraction at the quarry last occurred in 2019, I believe, and the last of the brick making took place in 2020, 
at which point the brick making operations closed and the site has been, been closed since then. So this is the, the site constraints plan I've put together. Um, in terms of the, the, the key constraints that the site is, although it's located on the edge of the village of Sharpthorn, as we just saw a moment ago, uh, it is outside the defined built-up area boundary of Sharpthorn, uh, with that boundary demarcated by the black line on the plan that is, sort of wraps around the south of the site. As members will have noted from the report, as well as being in the countryside, a key issue with the proposal is that the site is located in the high wheeled A O M B, which applies uh, across the whole surrounding area. Uh, there is an area of ancient woodland within the site itself. With the, this is shown by the green diagonal cross hatching here, with this located along the western boundary of the southern part of the site, where it backs onto some of the properties along Hamsey Road. Over in the southeast corner, this lighter green horizontal hatching um, is the, this denotes the, the triple SI, which is the site of special scientific interest. This has been protected because of its geological interest, uh, because of its location within the Waterhurst clay formation. So the Blue Bell Railway runs in a north south direction to the west of the site and it's at this point there's a private pedestrian crossing over the railway line at the end of Hamsey Road here which is uh, just immediately adjacent to the site entrance which is here. So the bright pink line on the plan uh, this shows the public footpath which runs just to the west of the railway boundary before it then turns east and runs along the northern boundary of the site and off towards New Coombe Farm. This plan also shows the neighbouring, so the nearest neighbouring properties, with these being uh, those houses on Hamsey Road, which was mentioned a moment ago, uh, Station Road, which are these properties here, and Highcroft Road, which is just a little further to the south, just on the edge of the image here. So the report you'll have seen references the nearest listed building, which is the Grade Two listed Old Coombe House, which is shown in red here on Station Road, um, just surrounded by a, a handful of other properties to the immediate south. And then the, the final sort of policy position to flag at this stage really is that the site is listed in Appendix A of the site, the MSDC, I should say, Site Allocations DPD as an existing employment site. So this plan shows the existing site in terms of where the brickworks are. So that's the northwest corner of the site I just highlighted a moment ago. Um, and this, is, this plan is really just to give you a bit more detail on, on the nature of that part of the site. So the, the plan on the left, this shows the location of the various industrial buildings and other ancillary buildings that are present on site at the moment and have been used historically to support the brick making process. The applicant states that the floor area of all these buildings comes to 9,816 square metres. This is probably also a useful point to highlight, although it's not shown in uh, great detail, I've got some photos later on, but to highlight the location of the non designated heritage asset on the site. This is being discussed in paras 12.144 to 12.160 of the report. Uh, and this is the old workshop, uh, which is located in this sort of central eastern part of the site, of the brick making part of the site. <coughs> Moving on to the image on the right, this shows the area of, areas of hard standing and external storage uh, that have been used to support the brick making activities and the total square meterage of these comes to close to 35,000 square meters. So although this part of the site is classed as an existing employment site by virtue of policy SA34 and Appendix A of the site allocations DPD that I just referenced, the applicant has adequately demonstrated that the loss of the existing employment land is justifiable in this case and the proposal is therefore development plan policy compliant in this respect. And it is on this part of the site where the brick making process has taken place that is considered to be previously developed land 
uh, also known as brownfield land. So this plan shows the rest of the site, i.e. not the brick making part of the site. Um, so it's beyond the brick making areas which are located up in the northwest area here. And this, this is where the mineral extraction has historically taken place. Uh, so th this land has been subject to uh, a restoration plan which has been approved by West Sussex County Council in their capacity as the Minerals and Waste Planning Authority. The restoration works were a requirement of the original planning permission for the winning and working of minerals from the site and have nearly been fully implemented on the application site itself. Um, I understand that it's, it's largely just some uh, sort of grass seeding that needs to take place when, when the time of year is better suited for that to happen. So the restoration plan covers all of the land that was used for mineral extraction. So it covers part of the application site uh, this being to the west of the, this is a rather crude red line that I've drawn on myself, but to the west of the, this, to the west of this line is the application site. Uh, but it also includes land to the east of the red line, with this being outside of the application site in different land ownership. So that's all this area here, with the main quarry that was located in this, this area here. Uh, so this land where the restoration works have been approved and the mineral extraction previously took place is not previously developed land and is essentially undeveloped greenfield land in planning terms. So the current and historical planning uses are important uh, because these have influenced the applicants proposals that are before you today. Uh, this, this is the proposed land areas plan which basically illustrates the two fundamentally different elements to the, uh, to the planning application. This shows, as indicated by the orange uh, shading in the northwest corner, this is the development area which includes the location of the proposed houses. And the larger blue area to the east is the proposed on-site SANG, which is required to mitigate the impact of the housing development on the Ashdown Forest. So identifying which parts of the site to develop has led to this site, laying, site layout being developed, as shown here. This is the full site layout. And this has been submitted as part of what is before you today as a full planning application. This shows the location of the 108 residential units on the 4.61 hectare northwestern part of the site, up here, where the brick making activities took place and which is therefore considered to be previously developed land. Building on previously developed land is an important material planning consideration to take into account in a planning balance as its importance is recognised through the NPPF. This part of the site also includes the location of the main access point into the site which utilises the, the sole vehicular access into the site off Hamsey Road, uh, which I, I showed you a moment ago on the existing plan. So this sort of main development area also includes, as well as the houses, includes open and green space, uh, the leap, all the internal access roads, including, including cycle and pedestrian access, uh, the, the car parking, a small car park for the Sang, which is located here, suds features, and a perimeter walk that features trim trail equipment on route. So this full site layout also includes the location of what is an 11.74 hectare Sang, also referred to as a nature park in some of the applicants' submissions, and this is on part of. Oops, I don't know how that happened. And that is on uh, part of a site that was used for mineral extraction, and where the approved restoration works have taken place that I showed you a moment ago. So this plan shows the housing layout and landscaping in a little bit more detail. Um, the houses are a mixture of detached, semi-detached and small terraces, supplemented by a small number of apartments located in a broadly central position here. The landscaping has been an important component of the application and the applicant has set out a number of key landscape features which are listed at paragraph 10.8 of the report before you. 
In terms of tree removal, the industrial nature of the site that members will have seen at the visit on Tuesday uh, really means that on the ground at the moment, there's, there are not that many trees to be lost given the overall scale of the proposal. Uh, this results in 18 individual trees and 13 groups has been removed and all these have been identified as being within the C classification, uh, which means there's no category A or B trees proposed to be lost. There is extensive planting to compensate for the loss though, uh, and this could be sh as shown with the new tree planting plan, which is this plan here on the left, although some of the detailed soft, so I don't know what keeps jumping, some of the soft landscaping details, the planting requirements, uh, do require further refinement based on the tree officer's, co tree officer's comments that highlighted some concerns about non-native species. But yeah, the, the landscaping condition will ensure that we, we only approve appropriate planting in the right locations. So much of the existing uh, boundary vegetation is to be retained and enhanced in places. Um, particularly that is along the western and southern boundaries. This is the western boundary here and this results in the removal of the rather alien Leylandi that members will have seen on the western boundary of the site on Tuesday. There is a linear area of green open space that runs through the central part of the site which includes suds features this follows an existing watercourse uh, and includes play on the way features. The leap is proposed in the southeast corner of this part of the site, whilst there will also be a circular perimeter footpath which incorporates trim trail equipment on route. So full details of both the soft and hard landscaping, the play facilities, as well as the management of these areas are proposed to be reserved by condition. Details for which would only be agreed be agreed in consultation with the relevant consultees. I should also note at this juncture that in residential amenity terms the applicant has designed the scheme to respond to the neighbouring properties and the houses are designed or located far away enough to ensure that significant harm will not occur through overlooking, loss of privacy or loss of light. The landscaping condition will though ensure that we can secure additional planting along the site boundaries where required. So these two images on this next slide show uh, the building heights and the tenure for the proposed development. The, the plan on the left um, that show that, so this is the building heights plan on the left. This shows that the majority of the houses, which are shown by the lighter blue, um, that's these, this color, these are to be just two story in height. There are, are a number of two and a half story buildings with these shown to by the deeper blue colours, um, that's these ones here, while there's two navy blue elements to the scheme, so located centrally here, which represent the two apartment buildings that rise to three storeys in height, uh, but only on their, their corners as, as illustrated by, not that plan, by this plan. So members will see from this plan that the taller buildings are located in the less prominent central part of the site with the two-storey buildings being located on and around the site edges. So I've included the site tenure plan on the right, which shows that the scheme is delivering a policy compliant level of 30% affordable homes, uh, which equates to 33 units, which is obviously to be, to be welcomed. I won't talk you through all these different colors uh, on this plan that are shown up in the key here as the mixed details for the scheme as a whole are set out at paragraphs 12.193 and 12.196 of the report. In terms of the affordable, however, 33 units are split between nine being for first homes and 24 for affordable rent. And the location of these properties are shown by the hatched colors and adequately set out uh, spread out even in the northwest part of the site, the central part of the site, and towards the southern part of the site. So overall, both in terms of the affordable housing tenure and the location, as well as the overall mix of the market housing too, 
uh, all, all these elements are considered to be policy compliant. So I've included this sustainability plan just to make clear what some of the sustainability credentials of the scheme are. In this case, the proposal includes the provision of EV charging points for each property, as shown by the red and the green dots. I'm not sure how clear they are, uh, but they are shown uh, for each of the properties. Um, air source heat pumps are utilised for each property, with these shown by the lighter blue dots. And PV panels are included too, as shown by the light blue squares it's reflected here. So, so it's not as clear as it could be. Uh, a condition is proposed to ensure the development is carried out in accordance with the sustainability statement, uh, as well as the slightly modified condition that I've just referenced in the update sheet. Although further details are required on the sort of specific details on the air source heat pumps and the PV panels. got some highways issues to talk you through now. Um, it's evident from the representations received from local residents and the parish that the highways impact is a, is a major issue locally, uh, which mu with much of the concern focusing on the safety impacts on road users and pedestrians in the vicinity of the site. So the plan on the left shows some works at the site access. That's the, uh, that's the part of the, of the northern end of, of Hamsey Road that will help facilitate safe access in and out of the site for pedestrians, cyclists and vehicles alike. So the works include some footway widening, a continuation of the footway into the site, uh, as well as crossing points, all, all whilst retaining vehicular access to the private drives of the local residents on Hamsey Road. So West Sussex considers that the use of Hamsey Road to provide access to the site is acceptable in, in, in safety terms. Uh, they've confirmed that the situation caused by parked cars where opposing vehicles may have to give way to one another is no different to many other situations in urban areas and is not therefore expected to result in unacceptable safety issues. Furthermore, the impact of traffic using the station road, top road junction is considered to be negligible in terms of the operation of the junction. So the plan on the right, this shows some off-site highway works at the junction of Station Road and Top Road. Works here include three new uncontrolled pedestrian crossing points located here, here, and a little further north. A new bus shelter on the northern side and road surface improvements. Uh, and all these proposals will, will help promote particularly crossing points and bus shelter will help promote active travel possibilities. So a number of improvements, including resurfacing and hand railings, are also proposed on some of the existing public rights of way to the southwest of the site to improve the existing routes and promote better connectivity to available services for future residents. This leads to the overall conclusion that there are no technical objections or reasons to refuse the scheme on highways grounds, and that's because the proposal is not considered to have an unacceptable impact on highway safety or result in severe cumulative impacts on the operation of the highway network, thus ensuring compliance with the MPPF and the development plan. Just moving on to, uh, I've got a few sample street scene elevations to show you now. Uh, just bear with me while I talk you through these. I'll try and make it clear as to which part of the image relates to where it is on the ground. But we'll start with this left-hand image, uh, which basically is of two split views along the central road through the site. That's this area here. So this shows the northern boundary of the site that's this part here. I've drawn a blue arrow to take you to the far left-hand image. So this, this part of the site is at the northern boundary of the site. Then that leads through to the south, which is this part of the image here. Then on the right-hand image is the street along the northern boundary. That is this one here, shown on the, the small plan. And this shows um, the northwest corner of the site 
uh, on the far right of the lower image. So again, using the blue arrows to take you to the right place. Uh, and the northeast corner of the site, which is here on the far left of the upper image. So I'll try to make that clear. That's not clear. Um, but yeah, it just gives you an idea of the, the, the street scenes and the, the design approach the applicant has taken. So the applicants adopted a, a bespoke design approach uh, to the design as a whole and the material use, which results in a scheme of a broadly traditional character, which takes its lead from the local vernacular and the former use as a brickworks. Since the scheme was first submitted, officers have negotiated a better quality scheme that has the full support of the urban designer. The urban designer is therefore happy with the layout, appearance and scale of the buildings, although some detailed design issues are to be secured by condition with these set out in Appendix A. In terms of the wider landscape impact, the Council's landscape consultant and the high wheeled AMB unit are both consultees who have been actively engaged in discussions on this site. And neither of these consultees raise any objections to the proposals, and that is a really a crucial point to make in this case. So this results in the conclusion that, through a combination of the removal of the existing unsightly buildings on site, the good quality design and layout, and the extensive landscaping being promoted through this development, the, pro the proposal is considered to enhance the AOMB. This as you'll see, is an, is an important material planning consideration in the planning balance and one that must be given great weight by the decision maker in accordance with the MPPF. So an important element of the scheme, as you'll have seen from the report, is the, uh, the on-site SANG, which is, stands for Suitable Alternative Natural Green Space. This primarily is aimed at relieving pressure from future occupiers of the housing development on the Ashdown Forest, which is valuable for its ecology and as a result is sensitive to recreational activities. So the on-site SANG master plan, which is this plan, has been developed by the applicant with input from planning officers and Natural England to assess its overall suitability. The conclusion being that the SANG will meet the Natural England criteria and this is reflected in the HRA, which is a document that was prepared before Christmas and is available in, in full on the planning file. The SANG itself is compatible with the agreed restoration works and is of a suitable size to provide the required circular route and to provide the adequate capacity to mitigate, the, mitigate against the impact of the future population from the 108 additional dwellings. Uh, the legal agreement will secure the necessary details on the SANG design and layout together with the management and maintenance of SANG land for a minimum of 100 years. Funding arrangements, which will include contingency arrangements, will also be secured along with some SANG monitoring. As members will have noted, the applicant is also looking at providing biodiversity net gain through this development, despite it not being a mandatory requirement of the application the application being submitted before the mandatory requirements kicked in. The Council's ecological consultant has assessed the applicant's submissions and confirmed that the development will achieve a biodiversity net gain of close to 40%, with all of this being on site. So all of the long-term ecological management required to secure such an uplift will be secured through condition, with monitoring alongside it secured in the legal agreement. Uh, the Council's ecological consultant has also confirmed that there are no objections in respect of the impact on protected species, with precautionary measures, mitigation and enhancement all being secured through condition. I should also highlight here that the geological triple SI, which I mentioned in the site constraints, um, on the site constraints slide, located in the southeast corner, is adequately protected by the development. I'm just going to get towards the end now, just providing a few photos and other images of the site. Um, so this is the first image is a view looking towards, from a central part of the site, looking towards the western boundary. Uh, you'll note a large expanse of hard standing and foreground, which is you know, fairly reflective of the, the site conditions. And 
large brick sheds in the background uh, with those very tall and slightly late land eye, which we, we noted on the site and I referenced a moment ago in the background, which is to be removed and replaced with more appropriate native planting. Photo two, just a closer up image of the same brick storage shed from the previous photo, just helps to illustrate really um, the scale of some of the buildings on site. Photo three, this is the looking south towards the rear boundary, so the nearest neighbouring properties to the, the, sort of the housing part of the site, are these properties on Hamsey Road, uh, just adjacent to the site entrance. This is just a photo of one of the large corrugated structures on site towards the northeast corner of the brick making area. This next photo shows, this is the old workshop, which is the non-designated heritage asset, uh, the loss of which, as outlined in the report, given it's a low level of significance, is outweighed by the overall benefits of the scheme. Um, yeah, so th this is part of the site looking south towards the ancient woodland that's within the site, within the Sang part of the site. Members will have seen from the site visit and from the report that there is a minor incursion into the buffer zone by a small part of the perimeter footpath. There has, however, previously been an incursion from an external storage area, as shown in this picture. Officers consider, therefore, that the ancient woodland will be far better protected than it is at present because of additional planting and the buffer zone that will be defined as a result of this development. So this next photo is the end of Hamsey Road, looking towards the site entrance, which just turns around the, the corner here. I just referenced a moment ago the highways changes. The next photo is from pretty much the same location, but looking south back up Hamsey Road itself. This is a view from the top of Hamsey Road, looking back down the hill, and here you get a good view really of the large industrial structures on the site in the background there, you can see their roofs. This is, again, from broadly the same location as the previous photo, but turned looking up Station Road. So this is the junction of Station Road and Hamsey Road. And this final photo is just a street view image from Top Road at the junction with Station Road, which goes down here. Top Road running along west east this way, Station Road going down there, where the other off-site highway works are proposed to take place that I just referenced a moment ago with the, on the image. So this, this image is a visualisation from the applicant that's looking broadly east, showing the linear area of green open space in the foreground. And just so you get bearings, that's the, the three-storey element of the apartment blocks that are located sort of in the background in the central part of the image. And the final image is an aerial image CGI that the applicants provided, showing the site as existing from a southern perspective on the left. You'll see here the, the brick making area here, the large lagoon, and then all this area here is where the mineral extraction, so where the sang's located, then the mineral extraction within the site and to the adjacent eastern side here and then the post-development visualisation on the right showing this is the, the boundary of the site. So this is the Sang area, there's the lagoon, and this is the housing element within that corner there. So in conclusion, the key issues for members are, are really as outlined in the report. Uh, the proposal has been found to be in compliance with a number of development plan policies are set out in paragraph 2.18 of the report. Um, the assessment has, though, identified some conflict with the development plan, this being in respect of what types of development are allowable under the countryside-related policies of DP12, DP6 and DP15 of the district plan. Officers consider, however, that this is a unique site and development, and there are material planning considerations that indicate a decision should be made that is not wholly in compliance with the development plan. For example, there are 
environmental benefits to take into account. So whilst the biodiversity net gain is welcomed, the primary environmental benefit, as recognised by the landscape impact related consultees, is that the proposal enhances the area and B. And just to re reiterate, this must be given great weight by the decision maker. The proposed development makes good use of previously developed land, something that is encouraged by the MPPF, and there is little reasonable likelihood of long-term employment use returning on this site. There are also economic and social benefits associated with the provision of 108 houses, of which 33 are affordable. Uh, that will also help boost the council's housing supply, and that must be maintained with windfall development being important in achieving this. So these material plans, planning considerations are considered to outweigh the identified conflict with the development plan and the application is therefore recommended for approval, subject to the dual recommendation before you. Thanks, Chairman. Thank you, Stuart. Right, so we move on to the speakers. Um, the public speakers are limited to three minutes. Um, I, the three minutes will uh, run down on the corner of the screen. Uh, I will try and indicate when there is a minute left, and at three minutes, I would ask you to wrap up in one sentence if you haven't already finished. Um, the first speaker is uh, Martin Robinson from West Hoth Life Parish Council. And the three minutes will start uh, as soon as you start speaking. But the Parish Council's objections were presented nearly a year ago before the election of a new District Council. There is a concern that even as a statutory consultee, the objections are lost in the 81 pages of documents on the planning portal and at the very end of the officer's report to this meeting from pages 119 to 126. Ashil Regen even stated in their latest brochure that there are no objections from statutory consultees. Council recognises that reuse of this site for some beneficial purpose is both necessary, desirable and in accordance with local and national planning policies. Council will support and discuss a sustainable redevelopment proposal which makes efficient and effective use of the previously developed area. To be properly defined as sustainable, this should have no detrimental impact on existing residents or on local infrastructure. It should also provide employment opportunities in accordance with the policies of the district plan and the neighbourhood plan. The current application does not represent sustainable development and should be refused. The fundamental reason for this is a failure to reconcile the location of the development with issues of accessibility and impact on local infrastructure, including the effect of additional traffic from a car-dependent development on the immediate highway network. An extra 600 vehicles per day represents a fourfold increase in traffic in Hamsey and Station Road. Council also has serious concerns regarding the positioning and management of the proposed SANG, which far exceeds the area required to provide necessary mitigation for the development. The adjacent Gravetire Estate provides 258 hectares of open public space land, so only the smallest SANG of two hectares is needed. The proposed SANG site prevents, forever, development of land to the east for housing, employment purposes, One and a left. second access to Top Road via the District Plan and Neighbourhood Plan approved residential development site. The officer's report states that the enhancement to the AONB needs to be given great weight. Council agrees, but not for this proposal. Council objects to the proposal as presented. If, however, it's approved, the Parish Council seeks the following. During construction, no waiting, parking of construction vehicles in the entirety of the parish, especially Hamsey Road and Station Road. A hall road to be provided during the 42 to 48 months of construction, and the landowner identified was willing to talk about this. Upon completion, no street lighting of any kind, as with the entire parish, and no burden for management or expense of the proposed SANG to fall on the parish council or parish residents, including those in the completed development, and support to be provided to the Bluebell Railway to keep open the permissive crossing between Hamsey and Station Roads, being part of the developer's travel plan. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Right, the next speaker, I believe, is Tony Grubb. I'm sorry, I was a bit late. I was, um, this slot became um, available only this morning, and I had to choose between sending a transcript to the council, and I just effectively got here just in time, uh, despite a... a, 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 a OK, well, your three, three minutes will start as soon as you start speaking, Mr Grover, so if right. you could... Three minutes will start if, if once you okay. start making a presentation. Uh, well, good afternoon. Very quickly, I'd like to apologise to Stuart Malcolm that, in good faith, I said in my submission that the update the council had transmitted to others hadn't reached me, but um, with hindsight, I was having IT problems, and with hindsight, it was there, so my apologies for misrepresenting that. Um, I've made a covering note with three attachments. As regards who I am, I'm part, part of the local furniture with um, intervening years in my mid-twenties, thirties in London, Salisbury, Lewis and the like, as a child of sphere. My great-grandfather made the initial commitment to farming in this area and we've been here since then. Could uh, you speak I, up a, a little please? Mr. Yes, yes okay. should I go closer perhaps? To, Thank you. Um, so um, I've had some uh, in, enjoyable diversifications from farming, which is the modern way or necessity, including a wonderful project with a step-by-step -step school for autistic children, which I persuaded DEFRA to assist with in the infrastructure costs. Since Ibstock decided to shut down West Hoth Fly Brickworks, um, I've been saddened by my thoughts about the reasoning for that and saddened by the sterilization of a usable and good seam of clay for the wonderful bricks they used to make there and M9 in the, um, in the Mineral Planning Authority uh, documents would have argued against that, but the past is the past. Uh, I have to say that I thought that the Ibstock restoration plan was never going to pass muster not least because of the input from a highly regarded civil engineer regarding hydrology, although that was more to my side of the boundary than the Ipstock side. Um, so the attachments, the, the first one is the most significant one. One minute left. Oh, crikey. Um, it's a case that with effect from 4th of October 2022, i.e. prior to the actual purchase, which the land... Any, I reached out to the Ashall representative. It was acknowledged the next day, saying that a director called Ben Boyce was liaising with Ibstock, but evidently not with me. I'd mentioned our mutual boundary, which offered scope for discussions, but stopped short of out outright flirting. However, as matters progressed, Ashill would surely have become aware of local reaction as regards, in particular, the access route for their project for such a significant number of houses relative to existing village numbers. They knew where to find me. They knew I'd be willing to have a discussion in general terms, whatever discussion agenda they put forward. That's the primary point of my representations. Uh, my willingness with effect from back in October 2022 to have talked. Um, will you tell me when to shut up, please? Will, do. They, they will, you, uh, will you wind up now, please? Sorry? Will you wind up now, please? The three minutes is okay. up. Well, the rest of the, my further attachments I will um, omit any comment on. They are what they are. Um, so I'll thank you for your attention and leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> right, the next speaker is uh, Philip Dobson. <coughs> Again, your three minutes will start uh, when you start speaking. Um, I'm Philip Dodson, a resident of uh, Hamsey Road in Sharpthorne. 
and I've been asked to speak on behalf of the residents of Sharpthorne to raise our objections to this planning application regarding the brickworks. There have been many uh, objections regarding this application um, over the period since it's been first submitted, and it's clear that the overwhelming majority of residents of Sharpthorne are against this application. However, I want to focus on what we see as one of the major reasons why you should reject this application, and that is the complete unsuitability of Station Road and Hamsey Road for access during construction, and of course the resulting massive increase in traffic that 108 new houses will bring once occupied. The roads are simply not wide enough, especially at the top end of Station Road, there is already a great deal of resident parking and traffic levels at peak times, especially at the junction with the already congested top road, which we believe would be unmanageable. During the construction, there will need to be a great deal of HGV lorries, other plant, worker vans and cars that will need to go up and down Station and Hamsey roads, which will be, in our opinion, unworkable and will cause a great deal of inconvenience, suffering and health issues from the resulting stress for residents of these roads. We believe a development of this scale needs an alternative access road to be viable. If you can imagine the chaos it will be caused when lorries back up, waiting in the morning to block the road, which we witnessed already when there was a smaller, much smaller development uh, at Bluebell Lane. Um, and it also would lead to preventing the school bus from being able to turn around which it does currently in the Station Road area. The top road is already uh, what's regarded as the unofficial East Grinstead Bypass and is very congested at peak times. Then if you add to that the significant amount of construction traffic that will undoubtedly occur during the four years of construction. On a different note, the other key things to consider is the already inadequate infrastructure regarding water and electricity supplies which we experience frequent, frequent outages of both. Minute, sorry, fact, just under one minute left. Sorry? One just minute. under one minute. Yes. Yeah. Uh, frequent out, outages of both. Beyond, beyond the planning aspects, as our elected representatives for our community, we urge you to consider the totality of the impact of such a large development would have on a small and already infrastructure deficient community. The houses will not meet the needs of local residents or are already struggling to find where to live, as the majority will not be able to afford them, even the affordable houses. We certainly don't need a nature park. We've got one with Ashdown Forest and Grave Tide, so that's no benefit for us as residents. Lastly, the whole application seems not to take into account the numerous objections that have been made, and the development style and size are totally out of keeping with the existing village, and we increased the population of Sharpfall by over 50%, with no planned improvement to any of our infrastructure. So we urge you to reject this application. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, the next speaker is uh, Councillor Gary Wall, uh, West Sussex County Councillor, formerly leader of this council, members may remember. Nice to see you at a paint job, Jim. <laughs> and you know, you know the rules, but I will repeat them that the three minutes start when, the, uh, when you start speaking. Uh, Chairman, members, thank you for allowing me to speak on this application. I'll attempt to be brief. I am the West Sussex County Council Division Member for the High Weald, and I'm speaking in support of the local district council ward members and the many residents who have also raised their concerns and have lodged objections to the application. It won't be lost on members today that we have had over 368 objections and rising. That is an exceptionally large amount with only one letter of support. That number of objections cannot and should not be ignored. Clearly the option to bring forward a brownfield site, of which Mid-Sussex has few, does have particular advantages. It is acknowledged that there will be some improvements to this particular area of the ANOB. But is this enough to permit 108 new houses? It is equally important that you fully consider the impact on the existing infrastructure, already mentioned. The local concerns and the sensible and well thought through suggestions expressed by the Parish Council. In particular those concerns regarding an alternative access at least through the construction phase. And of course the restoration plan. Simply is that plan good enough, wide ranging enough and ultimately deliverable? 
Perhaps the biggest question before you today is, where does this application sit within the agreed district plan? A plan many years in the making and very well respected. It is not an allocated or an agreed site. Members, do you ignore that plan, accept the officer recommendation, or do you support your own existing policies? Great, rate, great weight has already been mentioned to be accorded elsewhere in these policies. I would suggest the greatest possible weight is given to your own district plan. My final comment as the West Sussex County Council member will be on the highways impact. Highways will have carried out the usual desktop studies, but they will have carried out the modelling. But do they really reflect what local residents know? They suggest in 1281 that the impact will not be severe, but I would respectfully suggest that they may not be the case. District Plan 21 deals with this area and may uh, raise you, cause you to raise some questions. However, we do know the C319 already experiences severe traffic flow and congestion at peak time. One minute left. This is already a busy road, described by many as the busiest sea road in Sussex. And the scale of development proposed will most certainly and definitely have a negative and challenging impact on the local road network. Mm. We are already struggling to provide a safe and suitable crossing for children to access school. Members, please listen to all the comments from local residents today and give your careful consideration before reaching a decision that I'm sure will have a far-reaching effect on the local community. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Right, the uh, next speaker is Tracy Puttock. Actually, three minutes will start. Um, sorry, um, where are we? Uh, Mr. Dobson, could you move to your right very fractionally, please? Oh, yes, sorry, I'm blocking the time. So, <laughs> I'm struggling, struggling to see it. Yeah, thank you no, very I'll much. That for me. <laughs> <laughs> right, three minutes will start when you start speaking. Okay. Thank you, Chair. We didn't rush this application. We did take the engagement with residents, councillors and other stakeholders really seriously and we genuinely listened to what people said and ultimately submitted an application that was influenced by the feedback we had. Alongside the parish and community engagement, we met numerous times with Mid-Sussex and West Sussex officers as well as consulting with the Design Review Panel, High Wheeled AOMB, Natural England, Grave Tie Trust and Bluebell Railway. We work very hard to ensure the development is technically deliverable and crucially will not have a negative impact on our neighbours and local infrastructure. South East Water have confirmed there is sufficient capacity to supply the new development and technologies within each home will help limit water consumption. Southern Water have confirmed there is capacity in the foul network and we propose to replace an existing collapsed sewer running through the site which will improve flow. UK power networks have confirmed there is sufficient capacity in the grid to power the development, including air source heat pumps and electric vehicle charging. With PV panels and the highly insulated design of every home, the energy demand from the development can be kept low, along with new residents' utility bills. Being a brownfield industrial site, there is asbestos and soil contaminants to deal with. Our remediation and level strategy will remove all contamination with a clean capping layer inserted into gardens and soft landscaping and will leave the post-development ground levels more in line with natural gradients, ensuring all usable arisings can be reused on site, thus limiting import and export of materials. The drainage network on site was put in place many years ago to suit the activities of the brick factory and needs constant management, especially in peak rainfall periods. The drainage system we propose has been carefully designed in conjunction with your drainage officer to ensure that there is more than sufficient surface water storage on site to cope with extreme climate change flood events, events with controlled discharge rates, which represents a significant benefit for the immediate area. The former quarry area to the east of the proposed housing has been restored as required by the Historic Commission and will be safeguarded as a SANG, which will be open to the public as a genuine community asset. We understand the concerns from the parish relating to long-term management and it's very important to get this right. We've already shortlisted suitable management bodies who have experience, have experienced managing similar green spaces and a substantial financial endowment will be funded by the development and legally ring-fenced for the long-term management of the SANG with no cost to residents or the wider community. This will be governed by the Section 106. 
We are genuinely pleased with the scheme that you have before you, and I hope you can agree the application and all the benefits it brings. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think Neil Rowe is going to speak next. Yes. <coughs> Again, the three minutes will start when you start speaking. Good afternoon, members. I'm Neil Rowe of RGP, a specialist highways consultancy. We've had extensive input to the proposals, including proactive pre-application involvement uh, with West Sussex County Council as local highway authority and involvement with the public consultation process. In response to feedback, we've carried out a number of traffic and parking surveys to establish whether there are existing traffic-related issues that the proposal will exacerbate. Our detailed evidence-based analysis of the proposal and carrying out various surveys of the surrounding roads has ultimately led to no objections being raised by West Sussex County Council. When, when Ibstock were in full operation, the site had 138 vehicle movements a day, including 39 HGV movements. The impact of the HGVs is evident, with significant carriageway and curb damage at the northern end of Hansey Road. Residential traffic is more appropriate for this residential area. The number of vehicle movements has been accurately forecast and agreed with West Sussex through the use of the TRICS database and together with surveys of all dwellings accessed off Station Road. Modelling of the top road and Station Road junction confirmed that the traffic impact of the development would still enable the junction to operate well within its capacity. A detailed construction management plan would ensure that HGV movements um, are, are agreed and can be controlled and can be enforced. We're happy to work with the Council to agree these full details in due course. The existing access to the site has been reviewed uh, through an independent stage one road safety audit uh, and the, the improvements proposed has been confirmed as appropriate to serve the scheme. The layout includes detailed design of a two-way traffic entrance, egress and passage within the site for all vehicles including refuse and, and fire tenders. There's also sufficient width for pedestrian footway which would tie into the existing footway in Hansey Road. West Sussex's fire safety team have been consulted and are satisfied with the proposal and the access arrangements. Off-site highway works have been agreed with West Sussex, which include improving the existing anti-skid surfacing and road markings at the top road junction, new pedestrian crossings, new and improved right, bus one stop there. shelter and facilities at the top road junction, a new connection to the existing public right-of-way in the northwestern corner of the site and public right-of-way of surfacing and wayfinding improvements. In terms of parking, each plot would be policy compliance with, with allocated car and cycle parking, with plenty of visitor parking, and dedicated spaces would be provided for visitors to the same. Extensive due diligence has been undertaken collaboratively with Highway Authority and through full, through, sorry, with, through, throughout the pre and full application process to ensure that the development would not give rise to significant impacts in highway and transport terms. Any impacts that would be exacerbated as a result of the proposals would be fully mitigated through on and off site works. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And the next speaker is Sam Stockhouse. Again, three minutes will start when you start speaking. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Sam Stockhouse, Chartered Town Planner. Um, good afternoon. As you've read in the officer report, the proposed development will deliver a range of benefits to Sharpthorne and Mid-Sussex as a whole. These are undeniable and any perceived harm identified by the objectors arising from the development is significantly out outweighed by these benefits. The site is uni unique in the sense that it represents a substantial piece of brownfield land that has historically been used for heavy industry, detracting from the scenic beauty of the high-wheeled AOMB. This presents an opportunity for the site to have a fresh start and a sensitive, well-designed and landscape-led residential development providing much-needed affordable housing will guarantee its future once and for all. The alternative is that the site remains the same as it is now, vacant, ugly and unmanaged, resulting in ongoing harm to the setting of the A1B. Planning policy advocates a brownfield-first approach, particularly where it will reduce the need for development on greenfield land. This is highly relevant to Mid-Sussex and Authority, given that, it is, given that it is having to identify greenfield sites in the draft local plan to meet its housing needs. It is the fact that the site is brownfield land which provides exceptional circumstances for such development being permissible in the AOMB. As noted, this is a unique site and members and the public can be confident that granting planning permission for this development does not set a precedent for other sites in the AOMB to come forward for housing. 
The proposed development enhances the setting of the A and B, including views in and out of it. This is indisputable by the fact that when compared to the existing site, the <coughs> proposed development will reduce hard standing by 53%, volume by 6%, and footprint of built form by 23%. It will also increase green landscaping by over 1,400%. There are many, many other unquestionable benefits of the proposed development, including the 33 affordable homes, the 11.5 hectare nature park, as well as other areas of public open space and play areas, biodiversity net gain well above national requirements, exceptional sustainability credentials, including homes powered by renewable energy and electric vehicle charging for all dwellings, over £275,000 worth of contributions to local sports provision, and community projects to be identified by the Parish Council, and contributions in excess of 1.25 million to pay for identified improvement to local schools and to improve local GP services. So in summary, there are clear sustainable planning reasons. And Sorry, just under one minute. Thank you. In summary, there are clear sustainable planning reasons and substantial public benefits why planning permission should be granted for this development. And we respectfully ask members to approve the positive recommendation by the officers. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope the final speaker is uh, Councillor Paul Brown, the one of the ward members. Uh, Councillor Brown, as members are aware, isn't constrained by the three-minute rule, but uh, as we do to all councillors, I'd ask him to be as succinct as possible. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Members. This planning application requires your agreement on all four parameters. One, demolition of everything on the brickyard. Two, permission uh, to change for the change of use. Three, to build 108 dwellings. And four, to create 11.74 hectares of former quarry as a sang. Um, I want to draw your attention briefly to uh, six material considerations they are SANG, AONB policy, West Hoveley Neighbourhood Plan housing policy, sustainability policy, and drainage. Oh, and loss of employment. So six there. I'm going to be as brief as I can. Considering the suitable alternative natural green space, the SANG, the land proposed as SANG is neither suitable nor natural, requiring long-term management of land degraded by the quarry operation. Alternative opportunities for recreation already exist on the William Robinson Gravetie Charity, affording public access 100 metres from the application site. The enormous SANG is artificially creating biodiversity net gain credits whilst sterilising the land that should be earmarked for, for a haul road and for construction, for construction traffic and for future uh, uh, sustainable housing land availability in the future. Moving on to the AONB policy. The charm of Sharpthorne is that it's been gradually built up between the old West Hoveley railway station and Top Road. <clears throat> Almost every dwelling, uh, and the road and public right-of-way, are built on the steep gradients, which characterise its, its feature. Paragraph 1252, High Wield AONB, observes... The setting of Sharpthorn is atypical of settlements in the High Weald, with which I agree. The natural land level on the Brickyard site have changed significantly, particularly in the northwest corner, in order to create a level site for large brick drying sheds. It is proposed to plonk the dwellings on this unnatural artificial level. At para 12.51, High Weald AONB observe, the negative impact on surrounding landscape of the brickyard buildings. But these can hardly be seen due to the trees and vegetation, in fact. If permitted, the proposed housing will be a really significant shock to anybody approaching from the public right-of-way. And people will ask, I'm sure, how on earth did this council allow this to, allow this to be built? Recalling that two sites were offered for the site housing land allocation and were rejected by MSDC policy team on very negative impact on AOMB grounds. Yet now it's argued at paragraph 2.7 
uh, in the executive summary that the AONB will be enhanced by this development and must be given very great weight, emphasised by your planning officer. Do you understand this approach? Because I don't. Moving on to number three, West Hoveley Neighbourhood Plan Housing Policy. As a parish councillor, I participated in the uh, preparation of West Hoveley Neighbourhood Plan uh, from tw uh, 2012. And bear in mind, between 2014 and 2018, Mid-Sussex Mid -Sussex did not have a made district plan. As a precursor to the West Hoveley Neighbourhood Plan, a housing needs assessment and call for sites were undertaken by West Hoveley Parish. Landowners offered 13 sites in West Hoveley and Sharpthorne. Sustainability appraisals selected three sites for housing development, which are included in the neighbourhood plan. Due to West Hoveley's prominent elevated position within the High Weald, it was found impossible to select sites around West Hoveley Village. The three sites that were agreed in the neighbourhood plan referendum were all in Sharpthorne, and there was some moaning about that. And this is going to be even more difficult with uh, natural uh, English, English landscapes uh, in the future. Sites for new homes were identified uh, in West Hoveley Neighbourhood Plan Policy 8. And they are 8A, land north of Top Road, Sharpthorne, 24 dwellings. This development was recently confirmed in principle by Mid-Sussex District uh, Council Planning Officers at a pre-application meeting in January with Mr Grubb, who you've just heard, who is the applicant. This site is owned by the Mays Estate, the owners of the estate of the eastern part of the clay quarry. The, the owner is, is prepared, as he just said, uh, to provide a haul road into this application. 8B, site 8B, is land adjacent to Cookham's, Sharpthorne, 13 dwellings, and permission was agreed by Mid-Sussex D District Council Planning Committee in June 2023. And site 8C, uh, Bluebell Lane, Sharpthorne, 14 dwellings, was built and occupied during 2020. So West Hoveley Neighbourhood Plan and Sustainability Appraisals has not been considered in the assessment of this planning, uh, of this planning balance. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I can't find it. So moving on to the fourth item, sustainability policy in 2024. The need to de for development uh, and adaptation to climate change, sorry, the need for development and adaptation to climate change is recognised by this council. Sustainable planning policy is the main tool for enabling that change. In December 2023, full council moved district uh, plan Regulation 19 consultation, with only one dissenting vote. Policies in the adopted district plan are listed in para 11.7 in the, in the committee report. The adopted district plan reflects a radical departure from the settlement hierarchy, we all know very well, DP6, in the existing district plan. Chapter 12 of the, new, of the uh, adopted district plan, transport, um, uh, has a strategy that leads to policies DPT1, placement and connectivity, and DPT3, active and sustainable travel. Under the new district plan, West Hoveley and Sharpthorne fall into villages with very, little, very limited growth. The bus service is of no use for com commuting due to the recent withdrawal of the 1810, the last departure from Crawley. Now, two hours before is the last departure, 1610 from the timetable, yet in paragraph 12.74, the applicant's transport plan states, few additional trips by bus would make it unreasonable to seek a bus service enhancements. In paragraph 12.76, the transport plan relies on car sharing and provision of a bus shelter on top road. Uh, page 104, the public right of way improvements are a welcome commitment, but the paths are, are both very steep and even if improved are time consuming with a distance of 1.2 kilometres and are well above the recommended distance for walking to school with young children, quite apart from the topography. Thus, this large development is in conflict with policies DPT1, DPT3, which should be given significant negative weight in planning balance assessment and I can't find this in the committee report. 
Number five, loss of employment policy. Um, referring to paragraph 1228, West Hoveley Parish Council neighborhood, neighborhood Plan permits housing development, uh, but only with retained employment. But at 1224, members are being asked to change the entire site from employment to housing. Let's consider the office building recommended for demolition. The office block was built by the previous brickyard owner, Hudson's, as a head office servicing this brickyard and their other brickyards. Ibstock continued to make good use of it until 2009. Evidence of previous use of the offices was provided to me uh, by the managing director of Phoenix Building Products, who, had, uh, who were there for three years before, before uh, Ibstock moved to Leicester. The headquarters building was designed with internal petitions. It's suitable for adaptation to create several modern open plan offices. Together with ground floor extension for a building products exhibition area, the building has a floor area of 400 square metres, 1,300 square feet. Full fibre is available in Hamsey Road. Enabling reuse of this office building is consistent with West Hoadley neighbourhood plan policy, whereas demolition is not. Therefore, the application is not compliant with this policy. Paragraph 218 states incorrectly that the application complies with DP12. I am advised, and I quote, the Blue Bell Railway are looking for a suitable building to house our museum archive store. One of the offices of this site would solve this problem. It seems such a shame that a fairly modern building is going to be demolished. And uh, thank you for bearing with me. I come to the last one, which is surface water drainage. The reference uh, in paragraph 8.2 the clay quarry restoration plan was varied and agreed between Upstock and West Sussex County Council in 2022. You saw this plan uh, in the officer's presentation. The plan is key to understanding the proposed SANG. Unfortunately, how the reprofiled quarry is drained is not shown on the restoration plans. At the top of page 108 in the committee papers, it stated that Mid Sussex District Council are the flood risk and drainage team acting for the lead local flood authority. On page 93, they report, following extended communications with the applicant, the drainage team are now content, but there's no public evidence of correspondence, drainage engineers' calculations, peak runoff rates, pond levels, or pond outfall arrangements from the Sang and the Clay Quarry area, both, uh, both the western part uh, owned by the applicant and the eastern part owned by the Mays estate, which are, which are run into one another in a hydrologi hydrology way. Restoration contours of the quarry are shown on that plan, and so engineering calculations are perfectly possible, but we have no sight of any. At paragraph 12200, and this is really important, we're informed that Overflow from the lagoon shall be routed through the residential development and discharged into the watercourse on the northern boundary, considered to be acceptable in principle. The trouble is, this is not consistent with the architectural layouts, which feature a west to east drainage green swale towards the railway, which make a nicer architectural feature, but come to it. The architectural layout of the site has been determined by the proposed surface water strategy plan. This drawing lacks any information on the reprofiled clay quarry catchment area now proposed as SANG. The drainage drawing has a design risk notes box in it, which is completely void. Let's ask, do, uh, do recommended drainage conditions 7 and 29 in Appendix A safeguard flooding? Condition 29 refers to the lead local flood authority, but is too late and useless. It only comes to be, it to be checked when the, when the uh, premises start to be occupied. Condition 7 does not consider the water from the clay quarry crossing the development site at all. Lead local flood authority policy for the management of surface water states. The natural drainage catchment for the site needs to be mapped including the water that drains down into and through the site from outside the site boundary. Now, I, I can't work out whether the SANG is part of the site boundary or not. You maybe have to come to that conclusion yourself. 
Um, I, as I see it, anyway, I won't. The pre- and post-development drainage is to be based upon the whole catchment demonstrating how off-site drainage is being managed. Flash flood events will inevitably overwhelm the railway in the same way that they currently overwhelm the ditch on the east of Hamsey Road, owned by the, owned by the developers and formerly Ibstock. The clay quarry catchment area feeding the pond must be 20 hectares, and that's two square kilometres. The catchment area finding the ditch uh, that I've just referred to is probably about one hectare. When proposing some temporary remedial work to a man manhole on the, on the drain crossing the railway, Mr Ben Boyce from Ash Hill Regen, uh, the applicant, advised Bluebell Railway uh, there have been significant amounts of rain. This is following the, the flooding of the railway repeatedly, uh, much of which flows from the village into the, uh, into the lagoon. So this statement is both misleading and incorrect. The, loon, the lagoon catchment from the quarry and the land above the quarry, including the development site, uh, it, feeds, it feeds into this swale that's going across the site. Summer, may I sum up very quickly? The SANG is inappropriate, unnecessarily large, eliminating future development options on the clay quarry site. The AONB giving great weight that the development will enhance the AOMB is fanciful. The housing vastly exceeds the demonst uh, dem demonstrated need of the community and this parish in the neighbourhood plan policy WHP8. Sustainability is not compliant with adopted district plan uh, 2021 20, to 2039 policies, which is stated in the office report are being considered. Employment has not considered West Hoveley Neighbourhood Plan Policy WHP12. Drainage design does not come with lead local flood, uh, flood authority policy and poses serious ongoing problems for the Blue Bell Railway, I fear. Please refuse this application. Planning inspector will be able to make a much better job of assessing the planning balance. As an alternative scenario, refusal should hope, we, I hope, encourage the applicant to engage with West Hoveley Parish Council to arrive at a compromise planning application in accordance with the development plan which West, West Hoveley PC and the community can support. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Right. Um, we had three officers, all of I suspect I've got comments to make. Um, which one of you would like to go first? Um, yeah, I'm happy, Chair, just to wait for questions through members if, if you're happy with that. Um, I don't think there's any particular points of clarification that need to be made on anything that was raised by okay. the, the public speakers. Um, so, yeah, I'm happy to wait for, for questions through the committee. Fine. Sorry, um, yes, Steve Kim was going to make some comments then. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Just um, to pick up a couple of points that were raised by various speakers before we um, get into the debate. I think reference was made by um, Councillor Brown at the end to the emerging district plan, the consultation draft, uh, Reg 19, and various policies within that. But as is set out in the committee report, because of the stage that that plan has, has got in terms of its eventual um, adoption, only minimal weight can be given to that plan and therefore the application is assessed against the policies in the adopted district plan and that's the position, as members know, um, from previous committees, so, so that, that's nothing, nothing new. Um, reference was made by, by, I think, one of the speakers to the... Um, development plan, i.e. The, the district plan, um, being ignored um, as in, in this application. Um, that's clearly not the case. Um, you have a very detailed report that's gone through um, all of the policies, relevant policies in the, in the district plan and assessed the application against those. It's compliance with many policies where there's conflict that's set out in the, in the committee report. Um, and then the overall balance looking at the other material considerations as well, is, is all at the, in the conclusion of the report. So 
um, it, it's not the case that the development plan has been ignored. So I, I thought I, I must flag that up. And just the, the other point um, in terms of the representations that have been made as a whole, um, they have obviously been taken into account in the assessment of the application. Um, as members will, will know, um, local opposition in itself it isn't a reason to resist a planning application. Um, if we are looking at um, refusal of, of, of any application, it always has to be based on sound planning grounds that could be substantiated. So I, I just want to flag those things up at, at the outset to help um, frame the debate um, before we get going. Thanks, Steve. Uh, quite a lot um, was made of the drainage situation. So, Natalie, would you like to pick up and make any comments at this stage? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm happy to address any questions uh, that the members have um, specifically about drainage, but otherwise I'm happy to uh, leave it to them to ask. Okay, fine. And Ian, do you want to make any comments at this stage? Uh, thank you, Chairman. I'm just going to repeat something the Planning Officer said during their um, presentation. It's just to remind members of what the MPPF says in terms of development um, and transport impacts, namely that development should only be prevented or refused on higher grounds if there would be an unacceptable impact on highway safety or the residual cumulative impacts on the road network would be severe. So I think from the, the presentations we've heard so far, yes, I think it's acknowledged there's, a, there's a, going to be an increase in traffic on the road network, it's just for members to consider whether that impact is severe and unacceptable in safety terms. That's all I'm going to say at the moment, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, uh, open the floor to members if they'd like to push their buttons if they wish to speak. Mr. Rovery. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, my question is uh, essentially directed to the drainage officer, in actual fact. Um, uh, we walked the site on Tuesday, and a lot was made of the fact that you've got all the, the, the holding ponds, the swales, and also uh, subground attenuation uh, across the site to control the flow of water naturally coming down the slope. Uh, so the, 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 the impact on the Bluebell Railway at the, at the, at the at the southern end is 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 the key thing really western end so is 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 the key thing uh would the officer be happy that the impact on the on on the existing railway and the embankments and stuff won't be adversely affected by the proposals uh thank you councillor um so the flood risk and drainage strategy that's been submitted um, relates to water landing on the site um, post-development. There is no alterations proposed to any uh, culver culverted watercourts or drains outside of the red line boundary, um, and therefore the impact on uh, the area of the, the Bluebell Railway um, isn't considered as part of this planning application, uh, in my opinion. Thank you. Are any other councillors wish to make comment? Councillor Whitaker. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm very rarely first on the batting order, but um, I'll go now. Um, I find it ironic, um, thank you for all the speakers, by the way. Um, I find it ironic that uh, a number of the speakers are calling for a smaller saying and potentially more houses. Um, it, it's a strange strategy for um, potentially uh, asking for refusal. Um, be, I would say be careful what you wish for. Um, clearly the applicant has worked uh, extremely closely uh, with officers over time. Clearly the scheme has, has evolved um, an awful lot over, over, you know, over years. And in this committee we see lots of examples where that doesn't happen on, on a much smaller site. So I think the applicant you know, has to be congratulated on that. Um, I think it's a good scheme. Um, the saying, you know, we, the site visit was excellent on Tuesday, and you know, it's crucial to see all, all of the site uh, to, uh, you know, to see the, the full extent of it. Um, you know, of which only four, four and a half hectares are, and twelve are countryside, country park saying. Um, 
In regard to Councillor Wall's comments, he's very aware, obviously, of the 2018 district plan. That's now six years old. He's also very well aware that we, this district council needs a rolling five-year housing land supply. He didn't mention that. Uh, and when he was in this council, he made great play of that. So that, that's really important, as is the delivery for this council of affordable housing, um, of which this will be 33 units. Also on the mix here is uh, 75 private units, but significantly 55 of those are two and three bedroom uh, houses, uh, units. Uh, and, you know, and we often criticise schemes for too many four and five bedroom houses. So this is a very high percentage of two and three beds, which, which I personally think is very laudable. Um, it's an ugly site. It's been uh, dramatically you know, and spectacularly refurbished, if it does get permission here. Uh, and I think you know, the, the, the scheme in every respect, you know, it is um, the, the social, economic, uh, nature benefits, sustainability. Um, I'd be very interested to hear Councillor Eve's comments because she's normally very vocal um, on applications about the lack of EV, the lack of um, PV panels, the lack of uh, air source heat pumps, the lack of biodiversity net gain. All of these things in this scheme look pretty much exemplar to me. 39% biodiversity net gain, all on site. You know, uh, wow. Uh, infrastructure contributions, 1.537 million. Um, as highlighted by a couple of the speakers. That's over £14,000 uh, per unit, plus the 30% affordable housing, um, plus the, the, uh, the same. So, you know, clearly there, there are huge benefits here. The effect on the AOMB, um, you can't really see this site. It, it's, it's shielded pretty much on every side by the land escarpments, by the trees, by the railway. Um, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's really tucked away on the northern boundary. I do believe whilst it's not in the built-up area boundary, it is directly contiguous with the built-up area boundary. So effectively forms a natural extension um, to that. Um, also, obviously, there's no objections from the uh, high world area of natural beauty, you know, which is significant as, you know, was raised by the officer. So um, I, I think the scheme is very good and I'm supportive of it, Jamie. Thank you, Councillor. Right, let's Councillor Eves speak for herself, shall we? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, looking at this, it's previously developed land. It's ugly, I agree with Councillor Whitaker. The EVCPs, ASHPs and PVs are wonderful. What's not to like? Well, what's not to like is this is a purely car dependent place. That's the trouble. There are five buses a day, seven on a Saturday. You know, that's, that's really, everyone's going to have to travel by car. So access and car dependency are point to a non-sustainable situation. I'm concerned about the drainage and concerned that I think the officer said that it's none of our business if the railway gets flooded. I don't know whether I understood you correctly, because if you stand under that northwest corner on the bottom level, and it's such a big drop, there's a waterfall on the best day there's a waterfall going down there so I'm very concerned about the railway uh, danger to the railway too many houses 50% increase in population we've heard no need for that many houses I understand that as well and I do have to decry the loss in employment opportunity um, I'd like to ask about rural exception this is in the countryside this site so there should be some provision for local people who can't afford any other form of housing uh, the primary school is full, we hear, so where are the kids going to go? And another thing that really struck me is that as we walked around on Tuesday, there were deer prints everywhere, right? Deer prints in the mud. And the deer travel up from the railway and through. Now, if this is supposed to be a nature park, we're not just supposed to protect small things like newts. We should be thinking about the deer, and I refer you to DP38, restoring or enhancing ecological corridors. But I've been told that there's a plan to put a deer fence, a, a deer proof fence along the eastern boundary. And I wonder if we could have a condition to say that that should not happen because we need wildlife to be able to flow through these corridors. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Did you want to comment about that condition, Stuart? Yeah, we, we can certainly explore that. Um, 
there's there's certain requirements um, through the conditions on all manner of landscaping features. So if if members want to make reference to that particular boundary and that that all those those issues, then we we can. I'll throw my members' hands on that. Um, right, uh, I called De Councillor Swetman. He was having a problem with his technology. He did try and get in the queue some time ago. So, well, yeah, I did. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, uh, I'd like to thank Councillor Whitaker uh, for actually adequately summing this up. This is, to me, an uh, excellent uh, application. Uh, the High World AONB have been working with the uh, applicants and our officers. Uh, on the pre-development of this, so they're in full agreement. Um, I think a, a lot has been said about the traffic uh, entering the site. Uh, the actual pavement into the site is going to be extended by 1.5 metres. And, and yes, coming down um, Hamsey Road, there are cars parked there, but you know, when the site was active, there was a lot of obviously heavy lorries and traffic going up there. So I, I think it, it, I don't know, but probably might be better with the development there, as we've seen from the figures uh, that the highways have uh, intimated is uh, not severe. Um, and the, the question I was going to ask, it's already been asked, but I'll say it again, is, is the saying uh, it was mentioned that it was too large. Well, Councillor Whitty has already said, what is wrong with the large saying? The larger the better, especially for the biodiversity. Uh, and that's what we all try and attain in our planning applications. Um, I will let other members speak, but there's just one thing uh, I'd like to put to the case officer, Chairman, if I may. Yeah, surely. Uh, on the lagoon, um, Obviously, I wonder if we could put an informative because um, obviously members of the public are, are going to uh, use the saying and it's a question of safety around the lagoon and whether there uh, can be buoyancy aids put around in, in the aspect of safety. Um, I, th I think that's it. I'll stop there for the moment, uh, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah, thanks, Joan. Just just on that, yeah, it's a good point. I think um, maybe I wouldn't want to be prescriptive to say what they should do, but yeah, they should. We we can word something. Obviously, an informative can say anything it likes uh, ultimately. But in terms, if you wanted to um, add some detail to a condition around safety features without being prescriptive about specifically what, then I'm happy to amend probably. Probably the hard landscaping condition uh, to to include reference to safety features around the lagoon. Can I come back, Jim? Uh, yes, if, if the members are happy with that, um, obviously I'm concerned with the safety for young children. Even in two inches of water, they could drown if they run off from their parents and they get distracted. So I think these this lagoon is about two metres deep. So I'm seriously concerned about safety when we've got water. Uh, so um, I would like that to be conditioned. Members have agreed to that. Chairman? Yeah. Yep. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Well, I have an alternative view, if, oh. if I may. Rodney. Sorry, Councillor Jackson. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I visited the site on Tuesday. Uh, the site itself was a mess, and it's really not conducive in an area of AOMB. So something needs to be done about the site. Uh, this particular scheme does provide some additional houses and of course uh, what we do need is the, um, the right sort of houses in the right place. Well, in terms of the right sort of houses, I did say there's quite a few 24, uh, four bedroom houses. Can people afford to buy those or will that encourage people to come in from outside of, of Mid-Sussex to, to buy those houses? Um, but I certainly welcome the 30% affordable houses uh, distributed about the, about the site. Um, we've talked about drainage on the site. I mean, it's, it's on clay, so I mean that doesn't drain downwards. And of course, we noticed the lagoon and a number of sort of other drainage ponds on the site, and a, a strip of ponds through the 
uh, east-west across the site. Um, it's been talked about drainage quite a lot, but uh, one concern is, is there sufficient capacity off-site to take that water um, in terms of, obviously, some of the um, excessive rainfall we've had sort of recently, um, and it's likely to happen due to climate change. Uh, access is through the um, Hamsey Road, coming down when I, when I was one side of a series of cars parked on the, on the off, off the side of the road and then from on street parking. So <coughs> I think it may well be to have a construction management plan for traffic to make sure you don't get too many vehicles coming in during the peak, morning peak where it's likely to be, you know, have a <coughs> conflict between them and residents leaving Hamsey Road and then possibly uh, as the site gets developed as more and more residents move into the site. Um, just as an aside on a deer problem I mean I was at a meeting of the South Downs National Park online about deer and they say that deer is a problem in West Sussex not only for damaging ancient woodland but also chomping through residents um, gardens as well so um, we do need some way of controlling the deer in this, in this sort of area um, in terms of the SANG, well, one of the reasons for the SANG is to reduce the sort of use of Ashdown, um, Ashdown Forest by local residents as a leisure place to go and walk their dogs and all necessary. So part of the reason for a SANG is to reduce the effect on the um, Ashdown Forest um, area. And, and finally, um, in terms of the safety, not only at the lagoon, there are a number of obviously sort of balancing ponds and things throughout the site. So I'd also like to see some safety features there so uh, we don't have children falling into the water and, and having problems there. Thank you, Councillor. Um, yeah, the point about the um, management of the vehicles is uh, covered in Condition 8, that they've got to provide a management plan before they start any work on site. Councillor Bates. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, irony of it is I did turn up to site from here on a bike. The first comment I did make was, um, is there an alternative access, um, which has been raised by objectors and uh, the local residents, um, especially maybe a hall road, which seems to be on the off offer, so I think that should be followed through. Um, I think this is a very imaginative scheme, and I would call this a derelict site. So what would you do with it if you don't um, do what we're, what's being suggested? And I think that the saying in particular is more than I would have expected. The irony of it is that it's very flat, and I have seen in West Sussex County Council promote many similar areas for wheelchair access uh, people. Um, to go around and enjoy the land. So maybe that might be looked at in the future. Um, I mean, we've had two other local brickworks um, redeveloped uh, in recent times, Kima and also South Chaley. And there's never been any consideration about putting other employment on those sites, as far as I know. Um, so I think overall, we should go with this. Thank you, Councillor. Sorry, Councillor Prescott, were you wanted to? Yes, yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, I support this site. I think, as Councillor Bates has said, this is derelict land. But, you know, let's be reasonable and realistic about this. There are no reasonable or feasible alternative economic proposals for this site. An office block that's 10, 12, 15 years old is now an old building. It certainly won't be efficient to use uh, or to break up or to build and do anything different. And do, do the residents really want commuting cars going backwards and forwards? I really don't believe that's the case. I support Councillor Whitaker's view that the SANG is significant and it's something that we sit here many, in many weeks and wonder whether there's, there is enough. In this case, there is more than enough, and I think it's a great opportunity. I think the site's well laid out. 
I think it is imaginative, and I think from um, sort of getting towards net zero, it's a good, a good example of, of what can be done, and I think the developer should be commended on that. The comments I have with regards to safety, um, I don't think it is for us to prescribe what safety should be there. It is not our responsibility. I'll be interested in our solicitor's view. If we become too prescriptive, I think we should offer guidance and let the developer and the ultimate landowner, it is their responsibility for the safety of the residents. And as parents, we have safety and responsibility for our own children. But I don't think we should be absolutely prescriptive. Fencing, yes, that can be a recommendation, but I don't think we should be actually dictating what it should be from a safety point of view. And I say that as experience, a lifetime of angling, and I'm also chairman of the National Governing Body for Angling, and it is a key issue that if you are too prescriptive, then you can end up with a li an unintended liability. And I think we just need to be mindful of that and would take advice. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Did anyone want to make a comment or not? Yeah, please, Phil. Um, yeah, I think that's a valid point um, where planning can almost cross into sort of other, other areas, I think my preference would be uh, an informative rather than a rather than a condition on that point because I think it's a valid concern um, but yes ultimately I don't think it's the uh, the role of the planning authority to dictate the, the sort of safety measures that go alongside them okay thank you sorry sorry Councillor Prescott yeah which come back finished um, no, no other than so um, the only other comment um, is on the deer fence. Um, I suffer from deer on my own land and see the damage that they will do to the planting. The planting here is very significant and welcomed, but you do need to protect it, certainly in its early years, from deer. Otherwise, it's just decimated. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Swatman. Yeah, yes, in, in reply to Councillor Prescott, I think uh, uh, to say that we weren't going to prescribe what was going to go there, we were going to put some sort of safety measure. I think that was the agreement, wasn't it? No, the, the, when we talked earlier about the, uh, you putting in a condition, it wasn't prescriptive, it was going to be a safety measure, I think, that's what you said. Yeah, so I made the point that, uh, as Paul said, I don't want to be we don't want to be prescriptive, say, right, you shall have three buoyancy aids and fencing, no, no. etc. But it'll be for the applicant to demonstrate that they've taken the issue away and considered it and come up with something that they consider that's acceptable. I think that's the point that uh, Mr Weeks just made, that that's probably better served through an informative rather than through a condition that will require us as the planning authority to approve those details. Okay. Um, yeah, if I may make one or two comments from the chair. Um, I'm slightly disappointed that there isn't provision for some small industrial units there, but um, from experience, um, we've had a development in my own uh, village of 500 houses and three extremely large um, warehouses for distribution for the likes of Amazon. Um, they did put out... Uh, questionnaires and invited people for small units and there was just no take up of it and uh, I, again I would be careful what you ask for because frankly the uh, large industrial units are not a pretty sight and create a hell of a lot of traffic uh, in the village. Um, the other issue, the thing I think which is to me is the clincher is the fact that the high world ANOB think it is a vast improvement on what's happening on the site and if it's just left derelict as it is now it is going to deteriorate and you know I can't see that there will be you know any other options um, rather than having a, a decent housing development on there so um, if no other members have got any comments to make um, can I have a proposal seconder for the motion Councillor Sweatman, a seconder please. Councillor Whitaker. Right, could we move to the votes please? Right, though. Right. Recommendation. Here we go. 9, 10, 11. 
I'm showing. Is there one member hasn't voted? I've got 11 votes and there's 12 members. <laughs> Sorry, Councillor. Sorry. Right. Pressing it, nothing's happening. Okay, are you. Ah, we're there. Okay, thank you very much. Right, that's. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, right, there's 10 votes in favour, two against, so the motion is carried. And if I can, for uh, people who are um, watching online, read out the recommendation. It's recommended for the Planning Commission be granted subject to the conditions listed in Appendix A and the completion of a Section 106 legal agreement to secure the required infrastructure contributions, the necessary affordable housing, the on-site SANG and PROW improvements and the travel plan. Recommendation B, if a, a satisfactory planning obligation has not been completed by the 21st of June 2024, it is recommended that the application be refused at the discretion of the Assistant Director for Planning and Sustainable Economy for the following reasons. The proposal fails to provide the required infrastructure contributions, the necessary affordable housing, the on-site SANG, the PROW improvements and the travel plan. The application therefore conflicts with policies DP17, DP20, DP21, DP22 and DP31 of the Mid-Sussex District Plan and the Mid-Sussex Supplementary Planning Documents, Affordable Housing and Development Infrastructure and Contributions. Um, right, uh, do members want to take a 10 minute break? Will we change uh, officers or do they want to go straight on with the second application? Right, we'll have, okay, we'll have a 10 minute break. Um.
Okay, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so the application seeks planning permission for the demolition of the existing 87-bed care home on the site and the construction of a 78-bed care home. And just before I start the presentation, I just draw, draw members' attentions to the update sheet, and there's one item that relates to this application. So turning to uh, the site plan, the site is located between Copthorne Bank in the north and Boris Arm Road in the south. And as I said, it currently contains a vacant 87-bed care home. The, the care home building is located to the west of the site with the parking area in front. And beyond that, there is a mature garden where there are a number of trees that are protected by a TPO. There are two existing accesses to the site, one on Copthorne Bank, which is used as a service access um, for deliveries and refuge. And then Boris Arm Road is the main access for uh, visitors and staff of the site. To the north of the site, there are detached residential properties. And to the west, there is an area of open green land. And to the east is St. Francis Gardens, with a terrace of four houses adjoining the eastern boundary of the site. And to the south are residential properties. And the site is located within the built-up boundary of Copthorne. So this block plan just shows the site in greater detail with the mature garden here, parking area, and the existing building on the site. And now we have um, an aerial view. Again, you can see the existing building, the two entrances located here and here, and then you've got the mature garden located there. And these are just the existing elevations, just to show you um, the size of the building. It's a two-storey building with um, rooms in the roof. And that's the east and uh, west elevations. Right, turning to the proposed site plan. The new care home would more or less follow the footprint of the existing building. And the blue, the blue broken line that you can see here shows the outline of the existing building. There'll be 29 car parking spaces, two disabled spaces, and an ambulance bay. Landscaping is proposed to soften the boundaries of the site, and there's also a landscape secure garden at the rear, and also a secure courtyard at the front, and there would be a walkway between those two garden areas. In addition, you have the landscaped area to the east, which is also would be available for residents when they were assisted by either carers or family members. So turning to the um, elevations, the new building, as I said, would be quite similar in terms of massing form and materiality of the current building. And a traditional design approach is taken in line with the existing building. So here you have the north elevation, southwest, southeast, and this is where, where you have the main entrance and the two west elevations. So the, the roof line would be varied, would be a pitched roof with variations in height, and then there'll be feature gables and dormer windows. And the materials would be a combination of red brick, weatherboarding, grey window frames, and black water goods and black fascia. This just shows the south elevation, north, west, northeast, and the two eastern elevations. So turning to the floor plans, this shows the ground floor, which is colour coded, and the bedrooms are shown in blue, en suites in pink. And then the communal areas, which includes a cafe, a lounge, a cinema room, hobby room, dining room, and hairdressers. And then the green areas are staff areas. And the main entrance would be located here with the reception area. So turning now to the first floor, that would have a similar layout. Again, there would be two lounges. There would be a hobby room and a quiet room. And then similar layout, again, on the second floor with lounge members, um, residence lounges, and then you have a quiet room and hobby rooms. Right, this just shows um, a visual with the main entrance here. This is the car parking area. And then that just shows the uh, rear guard and the landscaping for that. So photographs of the existing building, which is now um, boarded up. This would be the, the front of the building. This is the car parking area with the mature garden TPO trees there. 
and that's the uh, rear of the side. <laughs> this shows the Copthorne Bank um, exit here, and then along here, and you can see the high boundary brick wall. This is the, again, the boundary brick wall, and you've got the green area in front of it, and then that's a pond uh, which is at the rear of the site, which is to be retained. So, uh, to conclude, the site does lie within the built-up boundary of Copthorne, so as such, a principle of development is acceptable under DP6, the district plan, and also policy CMP 2.1 of the Copthorne neighbourhood plan. Development is also supported by DP25, which supports the provisional improvement of community facilities and local services, and that does include care homes. And policy SA39 of the site allocations, DPD, supports new care homes within the built-up boundary. So the proposal will provide a new care home on the site with improved facilities and employment opportunities. The design of the care home is similar in terms of footprint, scale, form and materiality to that of the current building on the site. However, amendments were secured which included improvements to the elevations and layout with the rationalisation of window positions on the southern elevation and dormer windows aligned on the north elevation, such that the design is now considered acceptable. There's a neutral impact in respect of highway safety, parking provision, impact on neighbouring amenity, drainage, contamination, trees, and there would be no likely significant effect on the Ashdown Forest, SPA and SAC. Therefore, as set out in the officer's report, the recommendation is for approval, subject to the completion of a legal agreement which would secure the travel plan monitoring fees. And that ends my presentation. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks. Right, so uh, move on. We've got one speaker. Um, Amy Patterson, if you'd like to take your place. So, um, I think you were here earlier, but so I'll repeat that you've got three minutes from the time you start speaking. I'll try and indicate when there's one minute left, and then at three minutes, I'll ask you to complete your presentation. Good afternoon, Chair. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak today. I'm Amy Patterson, Chartered Town Planner. To begin with, I thought it might be helpful to clarify why the applicant, KUK, needs to redevelop the care home. Francis Court was originally built in 2009. KUK purchased the home from a previous owner in 2012, meaning that KUK had no input into the design and build process. Since then, KUK has focused on improving the operation of the home to enhance the care provided to its vulnerable and elderly residents. This has been in response to both COVID and to the deficiencies of the building in its current form and state. KUK hasn't taken the decision to redevelop Francis Court lightly. As you're likely already aware, KUK decided to close the existing care home last year as technical reports showed that there were deficiencies in the building that could not be restored through minor changes and that the home needed to redevelop in to ensure the structure and fabric of the building was safe and weathertight for the future. The KUK team supported the relocation of all residents to minimise disruption to their care as much as possible. We would not be pr proposing to rebuild the care home unless it was absolutely necessary. The redevelopment and reopening of the home will allow KUK to once again provide much needed residential, nursing and dementia specific care to 78 new residents, reducing pressure on local health facilities. It will also improve the layout of the home, helping to prevent disease transmission for diseases such as neurovirus, as well as future-proof the home against potential future pandemics like COVID. Increase the size of bedrooms and make sure that each resident has their own fully accessible ensuite wet room. Improve and increase the on-site communal living facilities and amenities for residents. Increase walkability through the site for the public by removing the gate on Copthorne Bank, something that the community was keen on during our consultation activities. Extend the private gardens for the enjoyment of residents by over 1,300 square metres, including the creation of new external amenity areas to the east of the site. It would also provide 90 full-time equivalent jobs and improve the sustainability of the care home by using brownfield land, reducing the carbon footprint by having solar panels and air source heat pumps, green roofs on the bin store, cycle store and sheltered seating areas, it will also secure a biodiversity net gain of 28% for habitats all on site. It will plant 18 new trees and over 700 new plants and scrubs. It will also promote sustainable travel, for example, providing active and passive electric vehicle charging spaces. 
The legal agreement for the travel plan is already agreed with the Highway Authority, just pending signatures following a positive outcome. 30 seconds left. KEK will continue to manage and operate Francis Court after the redevelopment and is committed to being a good neighbour to the surrounding community. To that end, the project team carried out extensive community consultation ahead of submitting this plan application. We are pleased that the response was largely positive, but we are aware that we'll, there will be temporary disruption to local residents when the home is being redeveloped. We are fully committed to agreeing a construction management plan with the council ahead of any demolition or construction commencing. We will engage with the local residents prior Wind to now, and during the construction. KK is very much looking forward to reopening the doors of Francis Court and being part of the community once again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, if I may make one or two comments from the chair, as a, it's in my, in my patch. Um, it is obviously uh, regrettable that a comparatively new building is being locked down, um, but we have heard that there are some structural problems with the existing building, which is unfortunate. Um, and my understanding is that um, whereas in the past it's been a care home, they are now wanting to uh, extend the um, people that they are able to care for there, the people with dementia and Alzheimer's as well. Um, it's building on the existing footprint, um, very similar uh, in size and appearance to what's there already. Um, so from a personal point of view, I can't see there being too many problems. Uh, any other councillors wish to make? Councillor, Councillor Bates. Um, the only issue would be, uh, Mr Chairman, I think it's a very, very nice, very pleasant looking building, um, is the discussion about car parking. And we've gone down from, uh, from 87 to 78 residents, but it seems it's going to be a more intense care. And there's mention here of 90 jobs, which obviously is going to be a shift pattern of working, so people coming and going. I don't imagine there'll be 90 people wanting to park there all at the same time. But could, I'm not too sure how many staff were there at, before it was closed in comparison with this, I would imagine, more staff now. What's the comment, sir? Yeah, I mean, I don't have the figures of how many staff were there before, but obviously there is a reduction from um, 87 to 78 and you'll see on in the highway section that there is no sort of standards for parking but highways are happy although, although there are 90 um, full-time um, full equivalent they, it does say in the report there would be about 34 staff at any one time on the site so um, I think the parking should be sufficient and I say oh, highways I haven't raised an objection I don't know if any really anybody's picked it up about the intensity of the care in relation to, it's 34 maybe now, but what was it before? Well, in terms of, in, 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 I'm not sure you mean by intensity, because there's a reduction in bed spaces. And oh, that's that, nothing to do with the, um, the number, it's to do with the, the nature of the care, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, one thing I would say is that the existing, I mean, I do go past there fairly frequently, um, the car park, that exists is never full. Uh, and I do know quite a, quite a few of the staff um, do travel there by bus because I have been on the buses when they've got off at the stop, which is about 30 yards from the entrance to the care home. Okay. Councillor Jackson. Hi, thank you, Chairman. Obviously, the owners of this particular property seem it's necessary to demolish the old building to bring it up to scratch in terms of sort of modern facilities and sort of a, a appropriate a buildings. Um, so in terms of the actual building, perhaps I also support this application. Uh, just two or three things come to point. She talks about using air source heat pumps in a large sort of facility like this. Are there going to be a large um, unit producing the air source heat and will it be noisy or will there be very strict noise control over that? We doesn't want to produce noise which will affect the, the local residents. Uh, also in car parking, we've always discussed with care homes about the need for fine car parking for uh, staff, for visitors, 
uh, for other people providing services to that care home. Um, and we always seem to argue that there's not enough car parking, but in the event, it does tend to be okay in the end. It'd be interesting to see what happens to the new care home in Sayers Common, where the similar sort of arguments were made about number of car parking places. But I think overall, I will support this application. Thank you. Um, right, Councillor Prescott. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, it's really a question on the design. I, th I think it, it is a, quite a substantial building, but the architecture looks a bit pedestrian and it doesn't look as imaginative. If you think that some of the um, private developments we see where you know, we, we, we discuss the, the merits of the architecture here, it's like for like replacement. So the design is something that was built, was it 2008, I think you said? Or it's quite a long way. And particularly what I don't like are the, the flat roofs on the dormers. You know, we go out, out of our way when we're looking at domestic situations not to have flat roofs on dormers. Here they're replicating what was already there, which was an old design. And so to me it looks like they're putting an old design back. And it looks, so as I say, it looks a bit lazy and pedestrian from an architectural point of view. I do support it if it's necessary and it's good for the local economy. I do support it. I just more of, from a design guide comment I'd be interested in. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, just to say it has been through design review panel and also our own urban designer. Um, and, she, you know, they requested some changes, like the dormers at the, at the rear weren't in alignment. Well, can you speak up? I'm sorry. Forgive the dormers me. at the rear weren't in alignment, but they, they've actually been aligned now. And I think you'll pick up from, obviously, from the report that the design review panel did sort of have some criticism of the design, that it was too similar. Um, and our own urban designer has said it's obviously not an exciting design, but overall um, she was satisfied with the design. And, and I, I think, you know, officers would support that opinion. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Eves. Thank you, Chair. Uh, redevelopment involves much greater embodied carbon than refurbishment and should be roundly condemned. These are not my words, they are the words of the inspector in the MS Oxford Street destruction case, which I think we should all look at, which has been batted back and forth in the courts. The High Court has now said they can demolish, but only because m and said they were going to pull out if they didn't. So I think we need to look at that one. Redevelopment is a terrible thing. This thing is only 15 years old. I cannot understand why they would want to rebuild. And actually, the building looks pretty much the same. So I really don't get this. And our own um, sustainable economy strategy says we're supposed to be moving towards net zero. This is not the way to do it. And for the developer to say that they're going to reduce their carbon footprint, they're not taking into account embodied carbon. Thank you. Do you want to comment at all? <coughs> I mean, the only comment I would make is that, um, you know, they have made... Um, representations about the existing building not being fit for purpose and I don't think it could be um, redesigned from the inside because I know there's problems with the roof as well. It's unfortunate as you say but I don't think there is any alternative in this case. And so, so your technology worked. It did this time Chairman, yes. Um... Yeah, but basically, it's been said this building is about 15 years old. It's no fit for purpose. The, the current building, okay, there's issues about maybe some members don't like the design or that's been in, in the papers, but it, it obviously suits the needs of the uh, providers of, of the care home. And, of course, the, a modern building will meet current building regulations, which will make it more sustainable and, and more environmentally friendly. Uh, the other important thing is that how they design the building for their own needs, they're obviously taking on a bit of dementia care. Now, uh, I think uh, dementia care is very important. There's not that many places, uh, as far as I know. There was a case in East Grinstead where it was at, um, being provided in a small amount at uh, Glenview, and that had to change, and they had to go to Crawley or somewhere else. So there is a need need for dementia care, so I'm very supportive of that and this application. Thank you. Do any other members wish to speak? Right, in that case, um, 
before you move to them, um, I, if uh, members are happy, I will um, recommend acceptance from the chair. Do I have a seconder? Councillor, <coughs> sorry, Councillor Whitaker. Sorry, Councillor Whitaker. Whitaker, yeah. Sorry, I said several hands went up. Um, yeah, Councillor Whitaker. Uh, right, could we move to the vote, please? Right, that's 11 votes in favour, one against. Uh, as before, I will read out the recommendation in case anyone's watching online. Uh, recommendation A, it is recommended that planning permission be approved subject to the conditions set in Appendix A and the completion of the unilateral undertaking securing the travel plan monitoring fees. Recommendation B, it is recommended that if the application has not sub submitted a satisfactory signed unit Lateral undertaking secure, securing the travel plan monitoring fees by 21st of June 2024, then permission be refused at the discretion of the divisional lead for planning and economy for the following reasons. The applicant fails to comply with policy DP21 of the Mid Sussex District Plan and the requirements of the NPPF to promote sustainable transport modes. Right. Um, there are no items recommended for refusal, so move on to item six, questions pursuant to council procedure rule 10.2. Do you notice of which has been given? I have none. Therefore, I declare the meeting closed at 16.19. Uh, I'll ask members to remain seated until the live stream is turned off, please. Thank you very much.